Um, today we will going to talk about the third guidelines uh, in the European Society of Cardiology 2022. And it's about the cardiovascular assessment and management of patients uh, undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Um, when we talk about the guidelines of the non-cardiac uh, surgery uh, <clears throat> assessment, uh, it has six parts uh, in the guidelines. We will divide it on to, into three sessions. Uh, today, we will going to talk about the clinical risk evaluation and the pre-operative assessment tools. Uh, next time, we will talk about the general risk reduction strategies and specific diseases. And the last time we'll talk about the last two entities, which are the perioperative anesthesia and perioperative complications. The last point, it's not in the guidelines, but I will add it to the last lecture uh, because it's uh, of utmost importance, uh, which is uh, preoperative assessment uh, for a patient on regular hemodialysis uh, that is being evaluated uh, for renal transplantation, as it's a very important entity and it has, does not have a lot of uh, recommendations yet. So, let's start with the first part today. Uh, the first thing to know is that the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery uh, are determined by two main factors. The first one is patient-related risk. So we have the risk of the patient on one side. And we have the type of surgery on the other side, the risk of surgery. We have the type of the procedure, including the circumstances which uh, it takes place under on. Experience of the institution, elective versus emergency, we will see the risk of the surgery. So when we're talking about morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular point of view, we have our patient on one side and the surgery on the other side. And this figure illustrates what I am talking about. This is the patient risk and this is the risk of surgery. Um, if you have a low, you can have a low risk patient and low risk surgery, and you can have a very high risk patient and very high risk surgery. And actually you might have to postpone or avoid this surgery if the risk of postponing the surgery is less than the risk of going with the surgery. So we will start talking about the surgical risk. So we will talk about the surgical risk from one point and then we will talk about the patients. What is the surgical risk? What is the definition of the surgical risk? The surgical risk estimate is a broad approximation. The surgical risk is a broad approximation of 30 day risk uh, of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke. So it's MACE including death, myocardial infarction, and stroke at 30 days, which only considers the specific surgical intervention without considering the patient's comorbidities. This is the risk of surgery without adding the patient into it. And we know the famous table that is in the previous guidelines and in this guideline that divides our surgeries into low-risk uh, surgery uh, that has a 30-day risk less than 1%, like the breast surgeries, the dental procedures, the thyroid search, the minor gynecological, and the video assisted uh, surgeries. We have the intermediate risk surgical risk from one to 5% risk 30 day of MACE, like the uh, carotid intervention, the endovascular aortic aneurysm repair, and the head and neck surgery. And we have the high surgical risk that is more than 5%, uh, 30-day risk of MACE. And let's think that the most famous is the aortic and major vascular surgery. So it's very difficult to, uh, to study this table and uh, have it printed in mind. 
But every time you see a patient for preoperative evaluation, you will need to check the table where the risk of the patient falls so you can go through the cardiological assessment. So the surgical risk, again, any surgical procedure may increase the level. Why the surgical risk is important? Why the surgery affects our cardiovascular system? Why it, we need to do cardiological evaluation for some patients? Because any surgical procedure may increase the level of cortisol and catecholamines at a stress response due to tissue injury and inflammation and neuroendocrine and sympathovagal imbalance. Also, during surgery, we have changes in the body core temperature. We might have blood loss and fluid shifts that may cause a rise in the vascular resistance, sometimes hypotension, leading to imbalance between the myocardial oxygen demand on one side and delivery on the other side. Finally, bleeding, blood transfusion, tissue injury, and the inflammatory response may lead to prothrombotic states. For these reasons, we have a risk of surgery that may aggravate the cardiological condition of the patient. After the surgical risk, let's talk about the timing of surgery. In general, the acute procedures, the ones that are not planned, carry a higher risk of complication than the elective procedures. We have to define the immediate surgery, the urgent surgery, the time-sensitive surgery, and the elective surgery. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of definitions in the literature, but for simplification, these are the definitions uh, that the guidelines recommended. So immediate and urgent surgeries are close from the definition point of view. Both include that surgery or intervention should be performed in the immediate without any delay, but in the urgent without unnecessary delay to save life or organ function. For example, uh, a major trauma patient with bleeding uh, intra-abdominal. Uh, then we have what we call the time-sensitive surgery. The time-sensitive surgery, this is surgery or intervention that should be performed as soon as possible as there is time-dependent risk of losing a limb, organ function, or increased risk of complication. Cancer is typically a time-sensitive procedure, as is carotid surgery to prevent stroke in a symptomatic case. The window, uh, the time window for time-sensitive surgery will vary depending on the underlying disease. And finally, we have the elective surgery, which is the surgery or intervention that can be performed electively, no, not further defined, without significant risk of losing a limb, organ function, or increased complication. So when dealing in the guidelines, the immediate and the urgent surgery will be uh, considered something um, almost the same thing. Then we have the time sensitive, and then we have the elective procedures. So we talked about the surgical risk which is the risk of the 30 days uh, MACE. And we classified the patient into low risk, intermediate and high surgical risk. Then we talked about the def definitions for timing of surgery. We have the urgent, we have the immediate, we have the time sensitive, and we have finally the elective. Next, we can talk about the type of the surgical approach. Uh, first approach is other than the open surgery is the laparoscopy. The laparoscopy has some advantages, but on the other side has some disadvantages. The advantages of laparoscopy are that it has less tissue trauma, less incisional pain, of course, and also fewer wound infections because the wounds are very small, better post-operative pulmonary function, less pneumonia, Diminish the post-operative fluid shifts related to the bowel paralysis, so less time to return to the normal bowel function with reduced hospital stay. All of these advantages uh, does not come free. They come with some risks and some complications. When we perform a laparoscopy, 
the surgeons perform what we call pneumoperitoneum. They have to inject air into the peritoneum. The pneumoperitoneum required for these procedures results in elevated intra-abdominal pressure. And when we elevate the intra-abdominal pressure, this causes a reduction in the venous return. While healthy individuals on controlled ventilation typically tolerate the pneumoperitoneum, patients with cardiovascular disease some with adult congenital heart disease and obese patients may experience adverse consequences from the reduced venous return due to the pneumoperitoneum. The pneumoperitoneum and Trendelenburg position result in increase in the mean arterial pressure, increase in the central venous pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure, and capillary wedge pressure, and systemic vascular resistance, which impair the cardiac function. So we have some advantages, a lot of advantages for the laparoscopy, but uh, not all the laparoscopy is safe for our cardiac patients. Therefore, compared with open surgery, the cardiovascular risk in patients with cardiovascular disease is not necessarily reduced in patient undergoing laparoscopy, and both should be evaluated in the same way. So whatever the patient going laparoscopy or not, it should undergo the normal cardiovascular evaluation. This is especially true in patients undergoing intervention, for example, for morbid obesity. The second approach, other than the open surgery, is the vascular and endovascular procedures. A famous example is the EVAR. The EVAR is associated with lower operative mortality and morbidity than the open repair. This is, of course, so we will see it in the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the surgical risk. It's less than the, the open vascular repair. However, the early gain in mortality from EVAR procedures is lost after three to four years compared with open surgical treatment due to general morbidity, especially cardiovascular mortality of abdo abdominal aortic aneurysm patients. So it has early benefit with allele mortality or morbidity at the time of the procedure. But if the follow-up after three or four years, they have an open repair, like the uh, EVAR from the mortality and morbidity point of view. <clears throat> this is a nice paper about the new development in the preoperative evaluation and perioperative management of coronary artery disease in patients undergoing vascular surgery. Patients are undergoing vascular surgery are usually high risk to be having and have high likelihood to be having coronary artery disease. So they thought of a way to help how to evaluate those patients before undergoing the vascular surgery. And what they came to, the revised Lee cardiac index, uh, risk index, based on the number of the risk factors that we do our uh, preoperative evaluation upon, the high-risk surgery, the ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, the presence of cerebrovascular disease, insulin-dependent diabetes, renal failure, hypertension, and old age, quantifies the cardiac risk. Uh, risk. So we can do this uh, revised index for the vascular surgery patients. Uh, unfortunately, stress testing is not predictive of myocardial ischemia or infarction, and therefore it should not be routinely done to these patients. However, the stress testing in these patients, in the high-risk patients, help to identify who may develop myocardial ischemia and will benefit from 30-day period to optimize medical therapy before vascular surgery. فالهدف من البيبر دي إنه يقول لنا إن العيانين اللي داخلين يعملوا vascular surgery احنا لازم ندور على risk factors ولو هم high risk زي ما هنشوف كمان شوية هنعمل لهم stress testing علشان نزبط لهم الميديكيشنز بتاعتهم لو البروسيجر طبعا مش immediate أو urgent قبل ما ندخلهم للmajor vascular surgery After the laparoscopy and the endovascular repair we can talk about the video assisted non-cardiac surgery and the video assisted non-cardiac surgery it is uh, mainly used for lung resection. Uh, the video-assisted non-cardiac surgery is supported by a trial showing fewer perioperative complications and a better quality of life in the first year following surgery 
for stage one lung cancer compared with the typical anterolateral thoracotomy. The overall, overall the benefits seem greatest in patients with reduced the fu lung, functional lung capacity, which makes sense. So uh, patients with uh, reduced the functional lung capacity undergoing lung cancer, uh, we can look for the, the video assisted of cardiac surgery uh, instead of the anterolateral thoracotomy, the one with a lot of complications. Uh, and this is the first recommendations in the guidelines that endovascular or video assisted procedures could be considered for patients with high cardiovascular risk undergoing vascular or pulmonary surgery. In other terms, if you have a patient that you will do vascular procedure for him, it's better to do it endovascularly instead of doing it open vascular surgery. And if you should perform a pulmonary surgery, to a patient with high cardiovascular risk, you better go for the video assisted technique instead of the anterolateral thoracotomy. Uh, and this concludes the first part, which is the surgical risk. We talked about the surgical risk and classified them into less than 1%, 1 to 5, and more than 5. And we talked about the type of the procedure, whether it's laparoscopy or video assisted or endovascular. And finally, we talked about the timing of surgery and how we should define them. So we would depend on this in the guidelines. After this, we have to talk about the patient-related risk. Uh, the patient-related risk is a combination of three factors. The patient age will play a role. The presence or absence of cardiovascular risk factors, example, the smoking, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and family disposition. And finally, if the patient has established the cardiovascular disease and comorbidities. So these three points or those three factors will define how we will go through the cardiovascular assessment algorithm as I will show soon. So the patient age, risk factors, establish the cardiovascular disease. So they classify the patients in the guidelines undergoing cardiological assessment for non-cardiac surgery into patients uh, younger than 65 years old and without any cardiovascular risk factors. Which risk factors? The one I said here, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and family disposition. Patients older than 65 and or with cardiovascular risk factors. And finally, patients with established cardiovascular disease, example, a patient who have had an MI, who have had a stroke, he has an established cardiovascular disease. So the recommendation is in the first step that in all patients scheduled for non-cardiac surgery, accurate history and clinical examination as a first step are recommended. And this makes sense. It is recommended to perform a preoperative risk assessment, ideally at the same time as the non-cardiac surgery is proposed. ملوش معنى إن أنا أشوف العيان النهاردة ويكون داخل يعمل surgery بعد شهر أو شهر ونص. فيكون in the same time. If time allows, it is recommended to optimize guideline recommended treatment of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors before non-cardiac surgery. For example, if a patient is undergoing a surgery for his gallbladder, a cholecystectomy, and this patient has uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, and dyslipidemia, it's better to control his hypertension and control his diabetes and put him on statin therapy before sending him to an an, a super elective uh, procedure. So this is the algorithm we will, uh, we will talk about. The first step is accurate history and clinical examination, including the standard lab test. This is class one. Advise on a stop smoking, optimize the guideline recommended medical therapy. It's also class one. Then we classify the patients into three entities, younger than 65 without any risk factors, older or with risk factors, those with established cardiovascular disease. And in each one, we will talk about the surgery, the risk of the surgery, 
This is the risk of the patient, the vertical columns, while the horizontal columns talk about the risk of the surgery. We have low risk, non-cardiac surgery, intermediate risk, non-cardiac surgery, and the high risk, non-cardiac surgery. So let's go through it uh, slowly. The first thing with risk factors, uh, what are the cardiovascular risk factors? Again, to repeat what I have said uh, shortly, they are hypertension, uh, smoking, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and family history of cardiovascular disease. So these are the cardiovascular risk factors that are included in the algorithm. Let's talk about the first column, those patients younger than 65 and does not have any of the risk factors I mentioned. Those patients, if they are undergoing low or intermediate risk non-cardiac surgery, nothing more to be done than the clinical examination, including the routine lab and optimize the medical therapy. If they are, high, they are undergoing a high risk non-cardiac surgery, for example, aortic surgery, if they are older than 45, we should consider ECG and biomar biomarkers, and this is class 2A. There is an important entity to remember in this group, the patients younger than 65 and without cardiovascular risk factors. Those patients, even if they don't have signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease, and they don't have family history of uh, ischemic heart disease, but they might have family history of genetic cardiomyopathy. For example, dilated, hypertrophic, uh, ARVC, restrictive cardiomyopathy, or non-compaction. If they have family history of any of these cardiomyopathies, they should be evaluated with an ECG and echo to rule out the presence of the disease irrespective of age and irrespective of the type of surgery. So again, we do history and examination for all patients. We optimize the guideline related medical therapy. If they are younger and no risk factors, uh, only if they are high risk non-cardiac surgery and uh, we do ECG and biomarkers. Other than this, we go to the second column. If they are older than 65 or have any of the risk factors we mentioned, in this line, they are the same, whether this or the, with those with established uh, cardiovascular disease. The difference between these two groups is that, as you see, that C-section 6. Section 6 means that they will have a specific management according to the cardiovascular disease they have. If they have ischemic heart disease, if they have cerebrovascular stroke, if they have heart failure, they will have a specific management in addition to what we are going to do. So if these patients are undergoing a low risk non-cardiac surgery, nothing more to be done. If they are going to do intermediate or high risk, we will do ECG and biomarkers. This is class one and we will assess the functional capacity. This is class 2A. Let's talk about the ECG and biomarkers. The biomarkers are highly sensitive cardiac troponin and NT pro -BMP. So if these patients are undergoing intermediate or high, you should do an ECG, a highly sensitive troponin and an NT pro -BMP. What about the functional capacity? How should I assess in these patients when they are undergoing intermediate or high-risk non-cardiac surgery? Um, the most famous um, score that we depend on is the Duke Activity Status Index. For short, it is called DAISY, or the ability to climb two flights of stairs. Why these two use? Because they have evidence from the literature. They, for example, we have found in a larger trial that the inability to climb two flights of stairs, for example, is associated with a high 30 days operative risk. The same goes for the DAISY score. This is so you can ask the patient, can you go up two flights of stairs? This is one way. And the other is you can ask him these questions to have the DAISY score. Uh, can you? Take care of yourself, eating, dressing, bathing, using the toilet. You walk indoors, such as around your house without shortness of breath. Uh, 
walk a block or two, climb a flight of stairs, run a short distance, and you add them together. Fortunately, there is online calculator for the DAISY score. You have you can use it from your mobile while you're taking history from the patient. Ask the question and answer with yes or no, then calculate, and then it will give you the score in metabolic equivalent. So uh, we talked about the surgical risk, then we talked about patient related, and then we put them together. And now we will talk about a specific entity of patients, patients that were sent for non-cardiac surgery, and they <laughs> discovered to have murmur, chest pain, or dyspnea. So the patients uh, undergoing non-cardiac surgery are often referred to a cardiologist because of a symptom, because of symptoms or signs that may be caused by cardiovascular disease. These symptoms, which are the murmurs, chest pain, dyspnea, or edema, on one hand, they may suggest severe cardiovascular disease, but on the other hand, they may also be, be caused by a non-cardiac disease. So we should evaluate them whether the murmur, chest pain, dyspnea are due to a cardiac disease or not. So to understand this, let's take some cases uh, from the European Society of Cardiology, Cardiology webinars. Uh, this is a case in the webinar for the uh, non-cardiac surgery. We have a male, 61 years old. He has type B chronic hepatitis with hepatic uh, fibrosis and hepatic carcinoma. Uh, this patient it is scheduled for liver transplantation. When they are examining uh, the patient, uh, they heard a systolic murmur, and the patient described dyspnea by walking. So, for these reasons, and he is undergoing a major surgery, he was sent to us for better assessment. The first step is the surgical risk. So the patient is undergoing a liver transplant, so his surgical risk is high. So he has 30 days risk of MACE, more than 5%, without anything related to his disease. If anyone is undergoing a liver transplantation, without the patient risk, he has a risk of more than 5%. So after we determine the surgical risk, we go through the uh, chart. The first thing that I have not mentioned yet is that you first ask yourself, is this an emergent or urgent non-cardiac surgery? If yes, we will not do any testing and send the patient to the operating room, but this patient, uh, this surgery, the liver transplantation for, uh, for the liver fibrosis is not emergent or urgent. But is it a time-sensitive? Yes, it is a time-sensitive procedure. When we deal with a time-sensitive procedure, as I said, it's different from one disease to another. Not all the diseases are homo homogenous. So back to our patient, he has hepatic carcinoma and will do liver transplantation. So uh, dealing with a patient undergoing liver transplantation for cancer is a time-sensitive matter. But we have time to analyze him and do some testing if needed. So where can we put our patient in this part? Let's go through more details to answer this question. So he, the patient has diabetes type two for 10 years. He is a non-smoker with no family history of cardiovascular disease. And again, he has chronic hepatitis, liver fibrosis and varicose veins in the esophagus. Regarding his symptoms, he has no encephalopathy. He has no chest pain. He has dyspnea when walking uh, three to four floors and reduced physic, uh, is this reduced physical capacity or not? This is, uh, he is tall and overweight actually. He has no edema or signs of increased uh, central venous pressure. And the murmur that is heard is a crescendo, the crescendo systolic murmur on the right side of the sternum, grade three over six. So, what does the guidelines say 
uh, when it deals with a newly detected murmur, um, if uh, an, in patients with a newly detected murmur and symptoms and signs of cardiovascular disease, transthoracic echo is recommended. And actually this is our patient. Why? Because we have a murmur and we have dyspnea that was not present before. So this patient should do an echo. Type. The next is our patient also have dyspnea. So in patients with dyspnea and or peripheral edema, an ECG NT proBMP test is indicated before non-cardiac surgery unless there is a certain non-cardiac explanation. So if you have a patient that is having dyspnea or lower limb edema, unless you have a certain non-cardiac explanation, you should do an ECG for, for, of sure and an NT proBMP to make sure if it's cardiac related or not. If they have dyspnea or peripheral edema with elevated NT proBMP, transthoracic all echo is also recommended. So back to our patient, he, uh, he is indicated for echo because the murmur is associated with a new symptom and uh, he has dyspnea. So we did ECG and biomarkers for him. His NT proBMP and troponin were normal. His ECG was normal. His echo showed normal left ventricular dimensions, normal systolic and diastolic function. The, the aortic valve was trileaflet, a bit sclerotic with a peak velocity of 2.1, so more than two, a mean gradient of 11, an opening area of 2.2 centimeters square. So the diagnosis is minor or mild aortic diagnosis with normal left ventricular function. So this patient can go to surgery or not. Actually, we will learn this in the next lecture but only what we could prevent us from surgery is severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, while mild aortic stenosis have nothing to do. And the NT proBMP was normal, so this dyspnea or this symptom is probably not related to his cardiac condition. This is the first patient. Let's take another example uh, of a female, 58 years old, uh, she has breast cancer, scheduled for mastectomy, and after the mastectomy, she will be treated for with cytotoxic agents according to the pathology of sure. She is referred to us for an ECG and transthoracic echo. She has no risk factors and no clinical findings. So is this patient indicated uh, uh, for doing ECG and echo or not? Let's go through the same steps. The first step is to determine the surgical risk and breast is a low surgical risk, less than 1%. Let's go through the chart. It's not an emergency. It's not an urgent non-cardiac surgery. It is a time sensitive because it is cancer, but we have time if we need to do more testing. Yes, our patient is younger than 65 and does not have any cardiovascular risk factors, and she's undergoing a low-risk non-cardiac surgery, so nothing had to be done. But the patient is referred for ECG and echo. So is preoperative ECG indicated? The answer is no. Is preoperative transthoracic echo indicated? The answer also is no. But let's remember from the first guidelines we discussed, the one for the cardio-oncology, this patient might be going to take her septin, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, with risk of myocarditis. So before surgery, she does not need ECG and echo, but definitely before starting the cytotoxic agents, she will need a baseline ECG and a baseline echo. Let's take a third example of a male uh, that is old, 82 years old. He has a stenosis of the spinal cord scheduled for operation. He is referred to the cardiologist with reduced physical capacity and peripheral lower limb edema. So let's go through the same steps. The first one, we go to, through the table. Our patient is intermediate risk. 
intermediate surgical risk for neurological procedure, which is the, sp uh, the spinal uh, cord stenosis. Let's go with history for the patient. He has hypertension for more than 15 years. He has rheumatic arthritis uh, on prednisolone for 10 years. And of course, you all know that rheumatoid arthritis is associated with seven folds more risk to develop coronary artery disease more than the normal individuals. Although it is not known as a famous risk factor for coronary artery disease, but it is actually. The patient has dyspnea and functional capacity. Remember, he is 82. Was hard to evaluate because of the pain in the lower extremities. He has no history of chest pain, no history of infarction before. On clinical examination, he has no murmur, normal lung findings by auscultation, and minor lower limb edema. Let's go back to this. So this is an elective. This is not emergency or urgent. This is not time sensitive. This is an elective procedure. Where does our patient fall? Our patient falls in this entity. Uh, he is older than 65 and has cardiovascular risk factors for coronary artery disease. And actually, uh, a patient older than 82 years old with all of these risk factors, I am not sure if he does not have an established cardiovascular disease. Whatever it's this one or this one, he will need ECG, biomarkers, and functional capacity assessment. His NT probe MP was elevated, was 4,354 nanogram per liter. His troponin was also elevated. His ECG showed unspecific changes. So do we need to do an echo? or not? The answer is yes, we need to do echo. Why? Because in patients with dyspnea or lower limb edema, our patient has both, and the elevated NT pro BMP transthoracic echo is recommended, of course, before non-cardiac surgery. And echo was done that showed moderate hypertrophy with an ejection fraction of 35% with no regional wall motion abnormalities. So what is the next best step? This is advanced to our lecture today. It will be taken uh, thoroughly next time. Uh, but uh, for the sake of discussion of the case, I have put it. So this patient, uh, as we will know next time, will should, must go. And they were convinced that this ejection fraction is due to ischemia. So he underwent ischemic uh, invasive coronary angiography with a 90% LED stenosis, LCX occluded, RCA 33 to 50% stenosis, and he did PCI to LED and LCX. We would have next time a debate about the type of the stents and the duration of that before the patient would undergo the surgery. And also, um, I think we, we might have, this is the answer in the ESCC um, webinar, but also after the revived trial, uh, which showed that in patients with a stable coronary artery disease and impaired ejection fraction, there is no difference between uh, uh, medical treatment versus invasive treatment. Uh, uh, treating this patient, I think, is debatable. So to summarize this part, which is patients with dyspnea, lower limb edema, accidentally discovered murmur. Uh, let's talk first about the murmurs. In the patient with a heart murmur without any symptom of cardiovascular disease, the value of performing an echo is not well established and consensus is missing. This is why they have put certain indications to do an echo when you hear a murmur. An echo may be useful in risk stratification for some patient, but whether it would improve the outcome is uncertain. Why it may not improve the outcome? Because it is important to bear in mind that the time delay when performing additional but unnecessary examination may worsen the patient prognosis. So um, when you hear a murmur, the not all murmurs, you should go directly to an echo. When should you do an echo when accidentally you discover a murmur on a patient? And this is the answer. Um, 
in a patient with new detected murmur and he has symptoms or signs of cardiovascular disease, you should do an echo. If the murmur is suggesting a clinically significant pathology, also transthoracic echo is recommended. Finally, um, in patients with a new detected murmur, but without symptoms or, or signs, uh, it should be considered its class uh, before moderate risk surgery, not uh, low risk. It should be considered uh, class 2A, and this is depend upon the availability of the echo and the uh, type of the procedure the patient is undergoing, but do not delay the patient. Uh, what about the patient complaining of chest pain? In an elective setting, if the symptoms are suggestive of coronary artery disease, the guidelines for coronary artery disease uh, patient in non-surgical settings should be followed. So if the patient is suggestive of chronic coronary syndrome, go for these guidelines. If immediate, urgent, or time-sensitive non-cardiac surgery is needed, the time for and access to adequate diagnostic tools may be limited. However, ECG and troponins can be used to detect or exclude ACS. So if the patient you are suspecting uh, coronary artery disease, and you have an immediate or urgent surgery, all what you can do is an immediate ECG and troponin, so you guide your treatment next. And these were the recommendation for a patient uh, uh, suffering from chest pain and undergoing uh, a non-cardiac surgery. If a patient scheduled for elective non-cardiac surgery has chest pain or other symptoms suggestive of chronic artery, coronary artery disease, Further diagnostic workup before NCS is recommended unless it's an acute, not elective NCS and he has uh, chest pain. In this time, you need a multidisciplinary assessment approach to choose the treatment with the lowest total risk for the patient. Finally, the patient presenting with dyspnea and lower limb edema. Uh, in the diagnostic workup to find the reason for dyspnea, uh, if a patient is suffering from dyspnea, you have to do spirometry, uh, D-dimer, uh, NT, ProBMP, ABG, and transthoracic echo have a diagnostic utility but limited specificity. If NT, ProBMP is elevated, as we said, you should do an echo. If it's not elevated, you should look for other causes of dyspnea before sending the patient for non-cardiac surgery. So in patients with dyspnea or peripheral edema, we have mentioned this before, um, ECG and nt MP is indicated. And if uh, the nt, NT MP is elevated, you should do an echo before non-cardiac surgery. Uh, next, we will talk about a different entity, which is avoidance or allowance of a certain surgery. In the clinical setting, it can be difficult to decide whether a cardiovascular disease represents a, card a contraindication to non-cardiac surgery or not. In general, the risk for, uh, for the patient, if not operated on, must be considerably higher than the risk of the treatment. يعني علشان معملش جراحة لازم تكون إن أنا معالجش العيان ده أأمن للعيان من إنه يعمل السرجري بتاعه. Uh, ideally, an unstable cardiac patient should be stabilized before non-cardiac surgery, but waiting can be detrimental for acute surgical disease, for example. No definite list can be made for which cardiac disease is a clear contraindication to non-cardiac surgery, but these are the what they concluded. NEHA class 4 severe heart failure, of course, patient with cardiogenic shock, patient with severe pulmonary hypertension, patient with severe frailty, this is, uh, these are contraindications for non-cardiac surgery. This concludes the first part of the guidelines out of the seven parts I mentioned in the beginning. The first part with is the risk assessment. The next part is the preoperative risk assessment tools uh, which when we finish this lecture will be finished. These are the uh, preoperative tools 
uh, we can depend upon, which are the risk scores, the frailty, the functional capacity, ECG, biomarkers, echo, stress imaging, and coronary angiography. These are the tools that we use to risk specify our patients preoperatively. We will go through and understand each of them and understand which one of them we will use and when. Uh, next lecture, we will put the, the picture all together and go through different algorithms and different cardiological disease for patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So let's start with the risk scores. We have several risk indices have been developed based on multivariable analysis of observational data and have been validated during the last decade. Most risk calculators integrate both the patient-related and the surgery-related risk factors, but none of them include biomarkers among their variables. The task force for the guidelines of the ESC recommended or decided against recommending one specific risk score. So if you need to use, you can use any of them. The task force also decided that the selection criteria for further preoperative testing should be clinical criteria and not based on a specific score. بمعنى اننا هنعتمد على الالجوريزم اللي احنا قلناه من شويه والالجوريزمز اللي هنقولها المره الجايه مش هنعتمد على certain score. Score ممكن يساعدك يعرفك العيان ده فين لكن مش هو اللي هيساعدك في القرار. ازاي يعني انت هتسال نفسك دي emergency emergent or urgent procedure هل هي time sensitive if you have time in a time sensitive if it's elective وبعد كده هتقسم العيانين لاصغر من 65 واكبر من 65 وعندهم risk factors وفي الاخر عندهم established cardiovascular disease هو ده اللي هنعتمد عليه مش انه certain risk score ودي ال risk scores المختلفه اللي الجايدلاينز uh, حطيتها the revised cardiac risk index, the surgical risk calculator, the American College of Surgery National Surgery, Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the surgical outcome risk tool, and the American University of Beirut cardiovascular risk index. Let's go and mention what the guidelines mentioned of each of them. I think all of you have been exposed to this RCRI which is close to the revised Lee criteria. It's composed of six variables, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, good congestive heart failure, diabetes, not all diabetes, the insulin dependent diabetes, serum creatinine more than two, not all renal impairment, serum creatinine more than two, and high risk surgery. Each one of these six can take one point. If the score is one, the risk is 6%. If the score is two, the risk is 10.1%. If the score is three points or more, the risk is 15%. And this is the high score. Or actually, the, from one point, you can de define it as a high risk because high risk is more than five. So high risk from one. It is made the risk of 30 day mortality, myocardial infarction, or cardiac arrest. And this is the first one and one of the most important. The second risk score is the ACS NSQIP score. As you see, it takes a lot of uh, variables. It provides an estimate of the absolute 30 day probability of serious complication or any complications compared with the average patient. When we compare the RCRI score versus the ACS NSQIP, the ACS NSQIP performed better when evaluated in US surgical database. But when they did an external validation in a trial in Philippines, found both to have excellent discriminative abilities for predicting any miss. The RCRI can be used without a web connection. It's as you see, it's a very simple score. It's six point. لو موجودين يبقى كل واحدة one point وهكذا. لو مش موجودين خلاص. على عكس ال ACS SQIP, which is specific and you can do it only online. For clinical use, the RCRI is more accessible. In vascular surgery, 
both risk calculators have shown moderate accuracy. So remember, never use these risk scores in vascular surgery. Attempts to generate procedure-specific vascular calculators have not given better prediction in validation cohort. Then we talk about the last two scores, the, surg the SORT, the Surgical Outcome Risk Tool, uh, that estimates the 30 days mortality. And the American University of Beirut index is the most recent uh, index to assess 30-day events. Um, and as you see, it's if score of zero or one point, it's low risk, uh, 1.3 to 1.6%. Um, seven point and intermediate two or three or high risk more than three. And this concludes the use of risk scores, risk scores as a tool to help me in risk stratification of my patients. Again, you can depend upon them, but they are not recommended by the task force. Uh, in you should depend on the algorithms that they have mentioned. A common word we all use is frailty. Uh, sometimes uh, you are uh, informing uh, an operator about his patient and you tell him his coronary angio shows kaza or kaza or kaza. And you tell him also uh, he's 80 years. He always asks you, is he a good 80 years patient or if he, he looks frail? And your answer is sometimes variable. You, you feel him frail, you feel him good. So we need a better definition and a better uh, understanding of the word frailty. Frailty is an age-related multidimensional state of decreased physiological reserve that result in diminished resiliency, loss of adaptive capacity, and increased vulnerability to stressors. I need to be able to magnet the complications. The perioperative evaluation for patients more than 70 years who require elective, intermediate, or high-risk non-cardiac surgery must include frailty screening, which has proven to be an excellent predictor of unfavorable outcomes in the older surgical population. فلو عندك عيان أكثر من 70 سنة هيعمل عملية intermediate or high risk لازم في ال في الالجوريزم بتاعك وانت ماشي تشوفه هو فريل ولا لا طب احنا عايزين حاجة اوبجكتيف مش سبجكتيف للفراليتي انا حاسه فريل انت مش حاسه فريل انا اعتمد على اشهر حاجة الفراليتي اندكس والفراليتي اندكس ده هتسأل البيشنت if he's taking any treatment for hypertension if he has cataract, arthritis and all this uh, there is a, a, a also functional and psychological well-being and the geriatric syndrome. These are the things that were assessed. So how to calculate the frailty index? You have applications online. It is actually the number, for example, you look for a uh, number of health deficit and you see how many of them are available. For example, if the patient, for example, I looked for hypertension, cataract, and arthritis, and the patient has only cataract, does not have hypertension or arthritis, so I looked for three, and he has only one, so he has one over three. So number of deficits is one, and number of health deficit measures is three, and this comes with the paralyty index. So in patients with age more than 70, scheduled to undergo intermediate or high risk on cardiac surgery, frailty screening should be considered using a validated screening tool. After the risk scores and after the frailty index, we can talk about the functional capacity. Quantifying the functional capacity has been a pivotal step in preoperative cardiac risk assessment, as you have seen. In the METS study, the DAISY, the score we have been talking about a uh, few time ago, had a more precise estimation of cardiac risk than subjective assessed the functional capacity. A DAISY score less than 34 was associated with increased odds of 30 days death or myocardial infarction. And this is to remind you what is the DAISY score and the calculator you can have on your phones. 
although the validity of interview based assessment of functional capacity has been questioned لكن في ترايل كبيره اللي انا كنت قلت لكم عليها a recent large prospective cohort of high risk patients undergoing non cardiac surgery لقيت انه self reported inability to climb two flight of stairs added incremental value to the 30 day cardiac event rate when added to the RCRI risk scores وعلشان كده الجايد لاينز قالت هنعتمد على الاتي and adjust the risk assessment according to the self reported ability to climb two flight of stairs could be considered in patients preferred for intermediate or high non cardiac surgery خلاص اشمعنى الحته دي زي ما كنا قلناها في الالجوريزم في البدايه after the fertility and the risk scores and the functional capacity let's talk about the ecg 12 lead ecg is widely available a simple test it's inexpensive we can use it to detect q waves indicative of previous mi detect unknown cardiovascular conditions requiring therapy like atrial fibrillation or av block Comparison with previous ECG is helpful whenever relevant abnormalities are identified, and also the preoperative recording of ECG is very important as it allows the identification of the changes that happen intra and post-operative ECG. Uh, after the ECG, we can depend on the biomarkers, and we have the troponin and the nt pro -BMP. Uh, Why we should do troponin? Because If you are suspecting a perioperative myocardial infarction, you need to have a baseline of the troponin before the surgery. So before the non-cardiac surgery, you will do an ECG. And in certain patients, you should do highly sensitive cardiac troponin. Then comes the non-cardiac surgery. And then at day one, you do follow-up troponin. And at day two, you do follow-up troponin. And you check for the delta change in the highly sensitive troponin. If the change in the troponin is more than the upper limit of normal, you gain th th uh, uh, then diagnose, as we will know next time, perioperative myocardial infarction. If, the, if you are suspecting a perioperative myocardial infarction, you should identify the cause, whether it's atherosclerosis and the patient needs coronary angio, or it is a mismatch between the demand and the supply, uh, for example, as hemorrhage in the surgery. And this is by clinical assessment, ECG, and echo. So these are the recommendations here. In patients with cardiovascular disease or risk factors older than 65 years old, or symptoms suggestive of cardiovascular disease, اللي هما الناحيتين اللي كانوا على اليمين في الالجوريزم. It is recommended to obtain a 12 lead ECG before intermediate and high risk non cardiac surgery. نفس العيان group of patients اللي عندهم cardiovascular disease او cardiovascular risk factors including age اكثر من 65 او عندهم symptoms. It is recommended العيانين دول انك تعمل لهم highly sensitive troponin before intermediate and high risk surgery. وبعدها بيوم وبعدها ب 48 ساعه يعني بعدها بيوم ويومين. And this is class one recommendation. لو رجعنا هنا كده. الالجوريزم ده العيانين دول والعيانين دول it's class one to do ECG and biomarkers وعرفنا البيوماركرز هم ال highly sensitive troponin before surgery وبعد يوم من العملية وبعد يومين من العملية. طيب. What about the NT Pro BMP? ال NT Pro BMP في العينين دول واخد class 2A recommendations. And finally بقى in low risk patients undergoing low and intermediate risk and cardiac surgery. It is not recommended to routinely obtain preoperative ECG or highly sensitive troponin or BMP uh, concentration. What about the echo cardiography? First, uh, if you, the patient is undergoing high risk uh, cardiac, uh, non cardiac surgery uh, in patients with poor functional capacity or high NT pro BMP, uh, 
او if there are murmurs okay you it's class one to do an echo if the same patient undergoing high risk non-cardiac surgery but with suspected new cardiovascular disease or unexplained signs or symptoms transrostic echo is class 2a if the patient is undergoing intermediate risk on cardiac surgery if he has poor functional capacity abnormal ecg high nt pro bmp it's class 2b uh, we have what we call a focus exam which is a rapid echo it's class to be to be done and finally routine preoperative evaluation as we do here uh, in egypt uh, it's class 3 that you do echo for all patients uh, the thing before last which is the stress imaging stress imaging is recommended before high risk elective non cardiac surgery so before high risk elective non cardiac surgery the ayanil andhom poor functional capacity or poor functional capacity اللي هي ديزي اقل من 34 او inability to climb two flight of stairs او اللي عندهم high likelihood of coronary artery disease ودول اللي هم عندهم بي تيست probability اكتر من 15% افتكروهم من الجايدلاينز بتاعت chronic coronary syndrome او عندهم two or more risk factors for cardiovascular disease dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, family history or عندهم resting ECG changes او LV dysfunction suggestive of coronary artery disease uh, أو لو عندهم high clinical risk well high clinical risk ده اللي هو ال RSRI score of 3 or more so if you have a patient undergoing a high risk elective non-cardiac surgery لو العيان ده عنده poor functional capacity زي ما قلنا هنشوفها ازاي أو لو عنده likelihood of coronary artery disease عالية أو عنده high clinical risk في الثلاث حالات دولة هنبعته يعمل stress imaging. طيب um, لو ال patient بقى بتاعنا asymptomatic وعنده poor functional capacity و previous PCI or cabbage ده uh, بيبقى class 2A انه يعمل stress imaging. الأخيرة stress imaging may be considered before intermediate risk when ischemia is of, in, of, on, uh, of concern in patients with clinic risk factors and poor functional capacity, this is class to be routine stress imaging is not recommended. So uh, before high risk, if you have poor functional capacity plus high likelihood uh, of coronary disease or high clinical risk, or if you have poor functional capacity plus previous PCI or cabbage, in intermediate risk, it's only class 2B. Routine is class 3 to do uh, stress imaging. And this is the last slide, which is when we do should do angiography to our patients. Actually, it follows the same indication for in, uh, <clears throat> as uh, in non-surgical setting. You can know them from the uh, guidelines uh, of them. For example, the chronic chronic syndrome guidelines, the revascularization guidelines, and the ACS guidelines. Uh, CT coronary angio uh, should be considered to rule out coronary artery disease in patients with suspected chronic coronary syndrome or biomarker negative non ST elevation ACS. Uh, so angio is class one, CT is class two A. Uh, Preoperative. Uh, invasive coronary angiography may be considered unstable undergoing elective surgical uh, carotid. Uh, routine preoperative invasive coronary angiography, of course, is not recommended. So, uh, this concludes uh, the first lecture. Uh, we talked about in this lecture about the, uh, the first two parts of the guidelines, which are the clinical risk evaluation. And this was divided into the patient risk and the surgical risk. And then we talked about the pre-operative -op pre assessment tools, which were the risk factors, the frailty, ECG, echo, biomarkers, uh, coronary angio, and stress imaging. Next time, we'll talk about the strategies to reduce the general risk 
and the specific disease, and then we will go through the rest. 